years old. I'm in fourth grade. One day I decided to start a lemonade stand. It was for fun. I was just into my head. We put a table out there and I made a huge sign this big. I had to color on it and it took me like a day or two to finish it. After I did the lemonade stand, I decided to give some money to the church. So it's one Sunday morning, I'm just standing in the atrium greeting people saying hi as people are coming and going. And then this lady walks up and she says, hi, my granddaughter here has raised money through a lemonade stand and she did a really great job yesterday. And now she wants to know what she's supposed to do with her tithe. And I look down and there's this young lady and she's got this money in her hand and she just doesn't know where to go with it and she's just ready and eager to give it. It was amazing seeing Liana want to give back to the church. I uh, told her about tithing and giving to the church, what it means and what, it, what God tells us in the Bible. And the next morning we got up and got ready for church and without me even saying a thing, she had already counted all her money, put the exact amount aside that she was going to give, the 10%, and had it all in her little backpack and ready to go. And it was, that was pretty special. You know, God gave us the whole earth and stuff, and the only thing he asks is just for some a tiny bit of something back. And so I walked her over to one of our little, like, inconspicuous silver boxes. You don't really notice them that easily. Walked her over there, she dropped the money in, big smile on her face, and I could just see the joy that it gave her. And I mean, obviously in that moment, it gave me a ton of joy. Um, you know, as, as a pastor here, always trying to encourage people to give and be generous because it's good for them. And seeing a young person who is getting this and who's getting this from the home front and who's getting this in Kid City and just kind of, you know, putting all those pieces together. And so it was really special, special for our team um, just to be a part of, of Liana's story. Well, how are we doing, Hope Community Church? Okay. I tell you, after watching that video, I'm like, we could just pack it up and head home. Like, that, she just, she said everything we needed to say for the day. Uh, that was beautiful, and it was great to see. Uh, I tell you what else has been great is uh, walking through this series we've been in for the past few weeks called The King and the Kingdom. Have y'all enjoyed this? Uh, it's been a blessing. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and as we've been walking through this series, we have seen some incredible things. Uh, let me just give you an update on what's been happening around here for the last three weeks. Uh, over the last three weeks, we've had 102 people who have signed up to be a part of a small group. That's 102 people who have taken an intentional step to connect to other people. And at the same time that that was happening, we've had 14 brand new small group leaders who have stepped up and said, I will lead a group. So all those people who have stepped up and said they want to be in a group, now there's 14 new groups for them to join. And that's a blessing, let me tell you. Uh, in addition to that, we've had over 155 people just in the last week who have signed up to serve here at Hope Community Church. Yeah, that's a blessing. That's people who have signed up to serve selflessly. And that means that when people walk into our facilities, our new buildings, or when they encounter people in and around the triangle, there's going to be a whole bunch more people who will help and serve other people. And that's a blessing from God. Uh, let me give you one more thing that's happened over the last three weeks, and this is a big deal. We have had 17 people who have said yes to following Jesus, and many of them for the very first time. Yeah. That's right. Now at Hope Community Church, we call these kinds of responses, we call them marks of a growing disciple. Things like living obediently, connecting intentionally, serving selflessly. These are all identifiers that tell people that, man, the people who are taking these steps of faith, that they have a relationship with Jesus. These are all responses to a good and righteous king. And so this week, I'm going to talk about another one of these kinds of marks. And the mark that we're going to talk about today is something called living and giving generously. That's what we're going to talk about today, the idea of giving generously. And to get a clear understanding of what I mean, because when we talk about generosity, most of us, our mind quickly goes to money, right? We think about money, but generosity is more than just giving of money. Uh, let me explain by, with a quick definition. Here's what generosity means. Intentional giving of our resources, things like our time, our talent, and our treasure to build up the kingdom of God. And not simply in times of abundance, but also in times of sacrifice. 
You see, it's not just giving out of the extra that we have. It's giving at times when it really actually costs us something to give in light of the king that we say that we serve. And defining it is pretty easy to do. Like all of us would probably agree with that definition. But I'm going to tell you where it gets hard at when we actually have to live this out. And that's because generosity is not just an act that we take. It involves the posture of our hearts. This is a heart thing. And personally, I got to tell you that this has been one of the most challenging things for me to embrace as a follower of Jesus Christ. Generally, living generously is just not something we talked about when I was growing up. Uh, in the area that I grew up in, um, we just didn't have a lot of money. And so there were very few conversations about generosity going on in my life as a child. And then I carried that over into my marriage because when we got married, uh, I was working for Uncle Sam. And as a brand new Marine, you made a lot of money. Uh, I made $480 a paycheck, $960 a month. And the mortgage was $500. Ask me how I remember that, right? Because it was serious. <laughs> it was serious. It was a tight budget. Now you're like $500 for a new place to live. Yeah, for a brand new house, it cost me $500 a month. That was in the 1900s. <laughs> and times have changed a little bit. <laughs> but at that time, we just didn't have it. And so when we got married, thinking about generosity was a little bit of a concern. Now my wife and I, we both grew up in homes where we had single parent moms who took care of our needs and even some of our wants. But they worked two jobs, they didn't have a lot of time. There wasn't a lot to just be generous with. And so we were kind of left with this sense of generosity that was a little bit of a challenge and we didn't talk about it a whole lot. And so when we stepped into our marriage, we carried what we learned from our childhood into the new place. So conversations about generosity would often land flat. Now personally, um, I think the thing that we really took away from those times was a lot of fear and anxiety. Because if something happened in your house and you don't have enough money, like if a, a, a car breaks down or if a tire bursts or if a washer and dryer stops working, it oftentimes turns into what feels like a crisis. And there's a lot of fear in those moments about whether you'll have enough or not. When we got married, we just carried that in. And it resulted in these two different responses from my wife and I. You see, I am the spender. My wife is the saver. So for my wife, her response when we ran into money problems or when we decided to try to be generous was to save all we could save, like put enough aside so in hopes that if we have a rainy day, we're going to be okay. That was her response. And when you said anything about generosity, her response was like, we don't make enough to be generous. And for me, my response was, we don't make enough, but boy, we're going to have fun with what we have. And so my response was to go out and spend and have a good time and hang out and have fun because you didn't know whether tomorrow was going to have enough. But underlying all of that was this real sense of tension in both of us, this real sense of fear, this real sense of worry. And I think if we're honest, we would probably say that most of us have experienced that same kind of fear, that same kind of posture of our heart where we want to be generous, but we're not even really sure what to do if we're honest. You see, everybody tells you to build wealth, right? To build up wealth, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But what happens when you get to a place where your bootstraps are strapped and you still don't know what to do? Well, that's kind of where we were. And maybe that's even where you are. You want to be generous, but you're not really sure what to do. And underlying not really being sure what to do, not having a plan, is this tension about one day everything running out and being left without enough. Well, how do you change the posture of our hearts, right? How do you do something different that helps you to step into this life of generosity that we believe that Jesus is calling us into? How do we live out sharing our time, our talent, our treasure with others who have need? Uh, the way that we do that is the way that we do everything else, by consulting the Word of God. Because any hard work that needs to be done is in the Word of God. You see, God has the power to repair hearts, and I believe He oftentimes does it through healing physically but he certainly does it through healing spiritually. So that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to jump into the Word of God. So if you have your Bibles, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn with me over to the book of Matthew, and we are going to read from Matthew's gospel today, okay? 
We're going to jump on into this thing, and we're going to read a little bit about it. But before we get there, here's what I want to do. I want to uh, kind of set the stage for you. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 19. Uh, we're going to look at verse, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 19. But let me set the stage for what's happening before we get there. Now, uh, Jesus is talking in this, and this is something called the Sermon on the Mount, right? It's a powerful set of scriptures, a powerful passage, and it's kind of this thrust that happens all throughout the gospel. And in Matthew's gospel, we see these two thrusts working together. The first theological thrust that we see is what it takes to be an actual Christ follower. How do you join God's kingdom, right? And we don't do it by pushing our way into God's kingdom. We don't do it by buying our way into God's kingdom. We can't even actually earn our way into God's kingdom. You see, that work to be a part of God's kingdom was done on the cross. And so the way we step into a relationship with Jesus and we uh, step into this space of being a part of God's kingdom is we simply bring our brokenness, our tattered lives, our sin and our shame, we bring it to the feet of Jesus. We put it in his hands and we put our trust completely in him, turning away from sin and towards God. And that's the good news who receives us with open arms. It allows us to step wholly into his kingdom. We become a part of his family, and then he begins to change our hearts from the inside out. That's how you become a part of God's kingdom. And then the second thrust of the passage, the second thrust of the Sermon on the Mount, is that now that you've become a follower of Jesus, now it's time for the work to begin. And we have to live as though we have been changed by this loving God. That's stepping in to the kingdom. Here's what that means. That means that what we say, we actually have to do. It means that what we profess, we actually have to practice. It means that what we say we believe should be a real part of our lives. And the truth is, in today's culture, being a Christian is probably the easiest thing to say out loud and not actually be. We have a lot of people who say that they are followers of Christ, but if you look at the life you don't see a changed way of living. You see, the truth is, is that our checkbooks, our calendars, and our commitments say more about whether we are a follower of Jesus or not than anything else. And they pretty much become our doctrinal statements to the world around us. And so what Jesus is talking about in this passage, in this Sermon on the Mount, is how we can be real with the faith that we say to have. We can be a real one and not a fake one. And when we get to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, here's what he says. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy. And where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there also will be your heart. Remember we just talked about this heart posture. And the heart posture is that underlying concern for all of this. Uh, and right away, Jesus goes right at something that he knows uh, we kind of hold near and dear. He goes at our treasure. He goes at our money. And he talks about it in terms of the condition of our hearts. You see, he's letting us know that the most likely place where we're going to get stuck in all of this is in our money. And he talks about these two things that we can do in response to what he's given us. He talks about building up the kingdom of heaven or building up the kingdom of earth. He talks about building up heavenly treasures versus building up earthly treasures. And earthly treasures eventually crumble. But heavenly treasures, they last for all of eternity. And so what he is encouraging us here is he encourages us to actually invest in things that last beyond this earth. He's, he's encouraging us to invest in heavenly treasure, because here's what Jesus knows about all of us. He knows that we have a tendency to get all we can and to can all we get and then to sit on the can and hope nobody else gets any of it. Am I right about it? He also knows that our earthly treasure is going to turn into earthly trash. He knows that everything that we value, everything that we hold in such high regard, that one day it's all going to end up on a truck driving down the road to the dump. He also knows that investing in the kingdom is a better way of living this life of following Jesus because heavenly treasure lasts beyond this earth. Heavenly treasure can't be stolen from your car. 
It can't be taken from your wallet or your bank account. It can't be lifted from you. It can't be taken or removed from your household. Our earthly treasures are things that will crumble, but heavenly treasures, those are things that last forever, that nobody can steal away because they last for all eternity in the way that they send people into the kingdom of God. And they go all the way to heaven. They're eternal. And they're meant to build up the kingdom of God. You know, I love the way uh, the author, and, or, uh, should be Randy Alcorn, says this. Uh, he is a world-renowned writer, and he wrote a book called The Treasure Principle, Discovering the Secret of Joyful Living. And it's all a book about living and giving generously. And here's what he asks when he talks about this idea. He says that when we leave this world, do you want to be known for somebody who accumulated treasures on earth that you couldn't keep? Or will you be known, recognized as one who invested in treasures in heaven? That could never be lost. And the truth is, is that most of us would probably say that we want to build treasures in heaven. But if we're honest, normally we store up treasures on earth. And I've, I've been very guilty of this. I mean, I love my shoes. I love my surround sound. I start to build up things as the spender in our relationship. But if I'm not careful... I'll build up earthly treasure and forget about my heavenly purpose. And I think the reason for this is the reason why we mostly build up these earthly treasures is because we see it all the time. You see, most of the earthly treasure that we see uh, is because we get marketed to. Right now, we are living in probably the most marketed to generation that has ever existed. Now, I go on Saturday mornings or uh, like Sunday mornings because I want to see early how my Wolfpack did, whether they beat Louisville or not. I want to see it. And so I go to watch my YouTube video and almost to a fault, they want to sell me something during me watching the highlights. All I don't want to do is watch the game, but I'm getting marketed to about a new house that I need or a new trip I need to take, or something that I need to do that costs me money. And here's the cycle of what happens. We see it, and then we want it. We see it with our eyes, and then all of a sudden, we want to start building up this treasure that we see because we want it, we like it. And even though we know we might not be able to afford it, or we know it hinders us from being able to make kingdom impact with the wealth that God's given us, we still go after it. And if we're honest, another way that we see the world is through the lens of how other people see us. I mean, we look at their lives and we think that they have more than we could ever have. And we start comparing ourselves. We start asking them, where'd you get that from? Or how'd you get that? Or how'd you do that? And anybody who has ever followed Jesus knows this reality and this truth. That comparison is the greatest robber of joy. And I think we live this way because of what we see. And we see stuff all over the place. And Jesus knows this. And so in light of this truth, he addresses it in verse 22. Here's what he says in verse 22. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are healthy, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, then how great is that darkness? You see, it's been said that our eyes are a conduit to our souls. And what Jesus is saying here is that we need to be careful with the things that we see. Because our eyes can create this kind of double life for us. Where we're saying one thing, but we're coveting another thing. Where we're saying we want to be generous, generous people, but our practice is not the practice of generosity. Where we're saying we love God, but our generosity doesn't actually reflect in the way that we live. Where we're saying we love others, but when it comes to time, talent, and treasure, and giving of any of those things... There's no real impact for how we live our lives. These double lives are something that we all at times walk into. And Jesus knows that sometimes we get there. Can I ask a question? You ever been there? You ever been in a place where you felt like you were pursuing all the things of this world and your eyes keep showing you new things and all of a sudden you want more and more and more? And so here's what Jesus says in response to that. He says that these double lives are not something that we can continue in. Uh, when we get to verse 24, here's what he says. He says, nobody, not one person, no man can serve 
two masters. Either they will love one and hate the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other because you cannot serve both God and money. We can't have this life of pursuing everything that our eyes show us and at the same time choose to serve God and build up his kingdom. This means that we have to choose. When we place our trust in Jesus, we allow him to take the throne of our lives. We say, God, we want you to be our Lord and Savior. And like every king, Jesus makes this claim on our lives. And that claim is exclusive because of his death and his burial and his resurrection on the cross. He makes a claim that's pretty serious. He says, I need to be Lord and Savior over your life. And here's the truth about him being Lord and Savior is that he's not going to share his crown or his kingdom with anyone except for those who have chosen to follow him. And so we can't put a crown on our wealth or a crown on the things that we see with our eyes and think that God is going to compete with that crown because he just isn't. He's not. You see, opposing masters demand different things. And they lead down different pathways. And this is where we have to make a choice. If we are going to live for God's kingdom or if we're going to live for ourselves. If we're going to live to store up treasures here on earth or we're going to live to store up treasures on heaven in heaven. And this is where our heart posture that we talked about comes into reality. Because it's a choice that we make. And we don't make the choice by what we say. We make the choice by how we live our lives. Can I ask you really quickly? Right now, as you listen to this, what's the posture of your heart? What's the posture of your heart when it comes to generosity? How do you do with your time? How do you do with your treasure? How do you do with your talent? Do you share those things generously to build up the kingdom of God? Or are you holding them closely Maybe even because of fear. Because we can't serve two masters. And the Bible makes that very clear. You see, most of us would probably say that we want to be generous people, that we want to live generous lives. But when it comes down to it, if we're honest, oftentimes we get stuck in a sense of fear. Uh, I actually asked the question as I was walking around and preparing for this sermon. I stopped into some offices and I spent time with some staff and some congregation members. I asked from people from different walks of life. I asked people who had money and I asked people who didn't. I asked people who were new to church and people who had been living a life of following Jesus for a very long time. I asked different demographics of people from all over our community. If we know that God asks us to be generous in the way that we live our lives, then why do we choose not to sometimes? And I mean, there were some answers that were given, but almost to a fault. Every single person said to me, because I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to run out of money. I'm afraid that I'm not going to have enough for my grandkids. I'm afraid that if I give generously of my time, I'm not going to have enough time. If I give generously of my talent, people won't appreciate me. They were afraid that if they took a step of faith and stepped out into giving back to the kingdom of God, that something was going to happen and they weren't going to have enough. And it didn't matter how little money they had or it didn't matter how much. I mean, I talked to one guy who's a multimillionaire. Here's what he said. He said, Dwayne, if I get one lawsuit, I could lose everything I have. And for me, being generous is challenging because I'm afraid of losing it all. I think this is the posture of many of us. I know it's been mine over time. And this is probably the reason why people choose not to be generous. And Jesus knows that we have this kind of fear. He he knows that this is a concern for us. And so here's what he says to comfort us in the midst of our fears. When we get to verse 25, here's what Jesus says. He says, therefore, I tell you, Jesus is telling us, do not worry about your life. Do not worry about what you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body or what you will wear. Because is life not more than just food and the body? Is it not more than clothes? And then he says this, look at the birds of the air. Because they don't reap or sow. 
They don't store things away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Can any of you, be by worrying, add a single moment to your life? Stop worrying. I got you. A little later in verse 31, here's what he says. He says, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But instead of doing that, here's what I want you to do. Seek first the kingdom of God. Build up heavenly treasure and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I got you. I believe a lot of us spend a lot of time worrying about things that haven't happened yet. And I believe that it hinders us from being generous people. But in this passage, God is telling us, I got you. Stop worrying. I got you. And I remember um, experiencing that for the first time. Just that simple truth helped me to understand God's plan for my life, but it also helped me to be a generous person. And as my uh, kids started to grow up, God just blessed us with more resources. Now, my son was one who um, just really worked hard to get out on his own. And listen, uh, I have a 24-year-old son. He's a great kid. Um, He worked for the summer and built up some money, and he was ready to step out into his first department for the very first time. And he's a great kid. Now, um, I was looking for a dial that kind of looks like my son, and all I found was this uh, black green lantern. So y'all just rock with me. It's the closest thing I could get. Like, just rock with me. But either way, um, so I'm talking to my son as we're moving his stuff into his first department. And I noticed, you kind of know your kid's mannerisms. I noticed that he was a little bit worried. And I didn't understand. I'm like, you should be happy, man. You're moving into your first apartment. And so I walked over to him. I could see he was kind of pacing back and forth. And I said, son, um, are you all right? And he kind of looked at me. And he said, dad, I'm all right. I'm excited about moving in this new place. But if I'm honest with you, dad, um, I just want to know that if something happens, if I get into a problem or a concern, If financially things don't work out the way I think they ought to, I want to know that I'm going to be okay. I want to know that you you got me and that I'm going to be okay. And so I'm, you know, recognizing the gravity of that moment as a father to see your son worried about the future or worried about what's about to happen. And so I remember this like it was like yesterday. I remember looking him square in the face and I just kind of said, son, I, I hear you. I hear you. But can I just say this to you? I think that's the dumbest thing you've ever said to me in your life. I think that's silly. Like, that's, that's the dumbest thing that you have ever said. And I didn't say it for no reason or because I'm a mean father. Uh, I said it because, like, here you are, and you are moving into your first apartment. Now, it was a new apartment, so he didn't have a lot. Um, I'm like, you're moving into your new apartment, but you're getting settled, and you're, like, starting for the very first time. Okay, just sit on the floor. It's fine. Right? But you're moving into your first apartment, which you do sometimes. You sit on the floor when you're in your new place. And, and I'm like, listen, from the time that you have been a child, right, uh, this is going to represent resources. Since the time you have been a little boy, your mother and I have been pouring resources into your life, right? It's been There's been so many times where we have just seen a need that you've had and we have stepped in to help you. Like we have provided for you. Uh, We have given you all the things that you need from the time that you were a little boy. Even when you ran into problems, we were here for you. We made it clear that we got your back over and over and over again. And when you needed a little, we gave you a little. When you needed a lot, we gave you a lot. We gave you everything you needed and even some of what you wanted. Now, here's what we weren't going to do. When you decided to be foolish or frivolous, we weren't going to step in and pour blessings on you in that moment. When you decided to do your own thing and go away from the wisdom of God, we weren't going to step in and pour blessings on you in that moment either. But whenever you had a need, your mother and I were there. We filled you up. We made sure you had all the stuff that you needed. See, we weren't here to fund your foolishness. 
But we made it clear as parents that we were here to provide for every need that you had. And the only way we were able to do that is because God had blessed us richly. Because God had blessed us to be in a position where we could provide for our children. And we were thankful to God for that reality. And so in our son's life, we have always been there to give him the things that, we, that he needs, the things that we were able to support him with. You see, I believe our son was sitting in that moment not realizing that he was swimming in the blessings of God. That he was swimming in the provision that his parents provided. I think when we get fearful, when we get to that moment where we start worrying about generosity, I think what God is saying us to this passage is that we don't need to worry. You see, God's proof has been his past. God's faithfulness in the past, it should give us the sense of confidence in the present so that we can rely on him for the future. We are literally walking in the midst of his blessings every single day, uh, our health. Uh, we're walking in the midst of his blessings in our lives. Uh, we have clothing and shelter, and we live right now in the wealthiest nation in all of the world. Is that not a testimony to God's provision? Does it not scream out loud to you that he's got you? So you don't have to worry. And when it comes down to generosity, our trust needs to be in him. Our trust needs to be in this righteous king that's provided so much for us. But here's what I know. I know that oftentimes we get stuck and crippled by our fears. Well, today what the Word of God is sharing with us is that we don't have to stay stuck in our fears. Instead of being fearful about the future, we can step into the future with the faith that God has got our back. It doesn't mean that he's going to give us all the money we desire. It means that as we trust in him, he'll provide for the things that we need and even for some of what we want. But here's the thing that he wants us to do with it. He wants us to be generous people who live generous lives. When I came on staff at Hope, Jimmy McDonald was doing my interview. He's our, one of our executive pastors. And he said, Duane, uh, what's your salary requirements? And I'm like, I didn't even know you could answer that question. Like, salary requirements? I was like, Jamie... I want you to pay me enough so I can be a generous person. Because over time, God had shown me what it means to be generous. And I wanted to share that with the world around me. How are you doing with this sense of generosity? Well, let me tell you how we're doing as a church here at Hope Community Church. Right now, uh, we are experiencing some significant growth in the ministry here at Hope. Uh, we have grown over the past year about 20% and engagement online and in person. And that is a testimony to God's faithfulness. Y'all give him some love. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have grown wide in our attendance and in our impact and in our uh, engagement. But at the same time, we've grown wide in that area. Truthfully, uh, our giving, our generous giving has not kept the same pace. And if we are going to be the kind of church who goes out into the highways, who goes out into the places where people don't know Jesus. If we're going to be the target church that makes a way to reach people who are far from God, we need those two things to align. We need those two things to be in congruence. A few weeks ago, we asked you guys to step up because we believe that God is sending us into the Fuquay Verena campus. And over the last several years, we have seen that that mission is something that God is calling us into. And so we have taken steps of faith. And now we're taking another step of faith to launch in-person weekly services into that community. And so we launched a campaign that's a part of something called Hope Where You Are, where we're calling it Your Peace Matters. Because here's what we know. If we're going to be able to step into something like that, every single piece matters. And let me just give you an update on where we are. So far... We have raised about a quarter. So far, we've raised about $234,000 of our goal. And our goal was in 60 days, we want to raise a million dollars to launch our Fuquay campus into the next phase of ministry. 
Well, listen, here's what I know. I know that there are many of you who have given generously to that. And for that, I want to tell you right up front, thank you for your generosity. But I also know that there are some of you who may be stuck the same way I was stuck as a young man in fear. Here's what I want you to know. You don't have to stay there. At Hope Community Church, our mission is to love people where they are and to encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. A significant part of our growth in Jesus Christ, a mark of a growing disciple, is that we would live lives where we give generously. So I want to encourage you today to do exactly that. And there's a couple ways that you can give. You can give online at gethope.net slash give. I do want you to know that this giving is above and beyond any normal giving that you would give. We believe that God has the resources to move us into the next phase of life. And so collectively, we need to do this together. And your peace matters. I believe that hope, God's given Hope Community Church some amazing resources. And I want to see every single one of us use this, these resources that God's given us to build up treasures in heaven. Let's take some time and pray together. Father God, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word that is true and that reaches into the very core of our hearts to change us from the inside out. God, you are good. And you have provided for every need that we have. You have even provided for some of the wants. I know that there are many who may be wrestling with fear, with concerns about giving generously. So Father God, I pray and instead of being led by fear, that all of us would be led by faith. I pray that we use our gifts, our talents, our ability, our time, our treasure, all of it for the kingdom of God. Help us to build up treasures that last for all of eternity in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, what a powerful message from Brother Dwayne Calvin. Uh, look, I, I have two sons. He's talking about his young adult children. I feel like I could take some lessons from him, although I don't know that I could tell either of my sons, uh, man, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Uh, my, my mom's watching right now. I know she's saying I can't say that, but uh, he's always got a good word, uh, and we appreciate him. Well, look, as he mentioned in his series, and we mentioned early on, uh, we're in the middle of this Hope Where You Are campaign where we're asking God to provide a million dollars um, to service the ministry in Fuquay as we reach this new community over the course of 60 days. So if you are interested in supporting that mission to reach Fuquay, we'd love for you to text the word GIVE to the number 72989. It's an easy way uh, just to be obedient and to give generously. All right? Well, look, today it's not over. Uh, across all of our campuses, uh, our congregations are honoring and remembering what Jesus has done on the cross and through the empty tomb through communion. And we wanted to take an opportunity to just set you up so you can do that at home or wherever you are. Uh, so go ahead and grab whatever elements you need. But I want to encourage you with this. We take communion really to remember what God has done for us uh, in sending his son Jesus uh, to sacrifice his life, to live in humility, even to death on a cross, so that we might have life. Um, so I'm reminded of this, and you can read the whole scripture if you'd like, but in Psalm 23, David writes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And some versions say, I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. He leads me by green pastures. He leads me to still waters. He restores my soul. So just as you take communion, as you pray, uh, just think about that. I don't know about you, but my soul could use some restoring. Uh, and in that, that can only come from the Lord himself. Uh, we can sleep all we want, but sometimes we wake up and we don't feel rested in our spirits and in our souls. I've had one of those weeks. Uh, so I would just challenge you to take some time today, uh, lean into who God is and receive who he is and remember what he has done. We love you, church. We'll see you next week.